so I'd like to welcome uh, everyone to this workshop. Um, my name is Debbie Stein, and I am the head of the Science Technology Policy Academy. So probably a good number of you have been in my workshops and other things I've done before for either one of my classes or NSPN or JSPG or some university um, out there. Um, so uh, if you didn't hear me earlier, it's really nice to get to know like where you are from. So if you could put, you know, like what city you're from and also like what kind of engineer or scientist you are that helps us get to know you um, uh, a bit better. Um, now in the past, uh, I guess it was maybe September, uh, Rachel and I started this new publication called Forefront. And so today I'm wearing my co-editor of Forefront hat on. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel so she can introduce herself and also, you know, tell a little bit about Forefront and, you know, why we started it. Thanks, Debbie. Um, so I'm Rachel Owen. I was one of the founders and former director of Missouri Science and Technology Policy Initiative. Um, and I just recently moved to Madison, Wisconsin, and am do doing some independent consulting work now. Um, but as Debbie said, uh, we're here today wearing our uh, hats as co-editors of Forefront. Um, so Forefront is a publication that's based on Medium. Um, it's an online blogging platform. And we were motivated to start Forefront um, and we chose Medium because we wanted a space where anybody could submit science policy analyses, blogs, op-eds, poetry, you name it, um, to a a central location and then we could amplify those voices. And so um, we launched it in September. We're still working on um, working through the kinks of the editorial process and getting some missions posted, but um, we're excited today to share some of our experiences uh, in communicating about climate change with policymakers and the public, um, but also share with you how you might be able to uh, take some of those ideas and concepts and submit them to Forefront. Um, after this workshop. So I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Debbie and uh, she'll lead you through the first part of the workshop and then I'll um, lead you through the second part of the workshop. And uh, one other thing I, I was gonna mention about Forefront before I get started is because I saw Sindhu uh, from uh, Stanford online and she's one of our associate editors. So you can also volunteer to be an associate um, editor and help us uh, in that front. Okay, so uh, let's... Uh, go ahead and get started. So um, I'd like everybody to kind of type in chat and just without looking up any data, doing any sort of sneak Google searches or anything, just guess how many Republicans you think view climate change as extremely or very important, think science is more convincing than it was five years ago, and then how much are you willing to pay, you personally? How much are you willing to pay for a carbon fee in dollars per month? And I want you to think about this very realistically, uh, not just say something off of the top of your head, but think about how much your actual income is, how much your discretionary income is. It doesn't matter if you're a poor graduate student or not, everybody's gonna have to pay the same fee. There's no uh, graduate student you know, postdoc waiver for this kind of thing. So just type in chat, where do you think um, you are on these different things? So just, you can just put Republicans, and just give some things and then put in this other information. So to just, we're gonna just take a moment to think about that. Okay. Okay, so we got a, a, a nice uh, range of um, answers here. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My dog's gonna entertain us today. Um, okay, so the, go to the next slide. 
what? Okay, so let's let's what? dive into some actual data. Uh, this is recent data, um, oh. and it is thinking about how does the you know it's from the this fall from nearest to Chicago, and basically how many think climate change is extremely Republicans I should say think climate change is extremely very important. It's thirty three percent. I think science is more convincing than it was five years ago, 30%. And how much are you willing to pay for carbon fee? Uh, this is, you know, as is everybody, not just Republicans, that's $40 a month. So some of you are on the low end of the spectrum there, which uh, you might find interesting. And uh, it, it gives you something to also think about is that when we have carbon fees, let's just say it's a gasoline tax, everybody pays the same amount. But when we have tax rates, they vary depending on income. So I mentioned that just so you can sort of think about some of the nuances about these things. It also makes a big difference what state you come from. If you drive a car, if you drive, you know, if you, know, you live out in the middle of nowhere versus like in a big city, like New York City, um, and, and uh, you have to think about that. So let's uh, sort of moving on there. Okay, so this is again from, from EPIC, that's Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. So uh, first, let's, this, this is kind of been like this nice overview presentation. So 59% of Americans, uh, which includes most Democrats and a third Republicans, view climate change is very or extremely important. And about half of Americans support a type of clean electricity standard and a requirement that all new vehicles are electric. And about half of Americans are willing to pay something for a fee on carbon. So we have here overall, you know, about half of uh, Americans on most of these issues. And it's been, you know, pretty steady uh, over the decades. One time I looked at poll data going back, you know, decades and things are very much the same. But if we um, go to the next slide, um, we're going to see. Uh, something which is kind of nice to see, actually, which is this, this middle poll here, where it says science is more convincing, um, that half are more convinced by science than they were five years ago. And, and that includes about a third of Republicans and two thirds of Democrats. So I think, you know, I view that as a very promising sign that, you know, sometimes I think, uh, you know, particularly with the pandemic, that like nobody's listening to scientists and things like that. But um, that kind of shows that's not the case. Oh, hold on, somebody was muted. There we go. Oh. Okay, hold on. I'm trying to figure out who's not muted. There we go. Okay, so uh, moving on. Okay, and this you know is interesting because this is the support. Uh, um, uh, for a, a carbon fee. Um, so you can see the different sort of dollar amounts in terms of how much people are willing to pay. And you'll note that some, that it goes from as low as a dollar to as much as um, $100. So it's, it's a, quite a, um, a range, but most people it's not zero. And so that's you know, really what we want to think about it. From then on, it's a, it's a negotiation. So when we go to the next slide, you know, we're going to see things about implementing a clean um, electricity standard. And you'll see here, of course, although Democrats dominate, we still have, you know, a strong third who are uh, of Republicans who are willing to implement a clean electricity standard or require new electric vehicles. Now, I'm, I'm curious for some of you who are out there, um, how many of you, you know, sort of are surprised by these numbers? Are you thinking like, you know, now one thing is sort of Sam here mentions about very different from things in Idaho, this, we're, this is gonna differ you know, across the country, just like our electoral politics do. And so that's something else that we have to think about. And that's why it's really important to think uh, local. So moving on. Now, this is something else to, uh, to look, about, look at. Again, uh, you might be surprised that there's something called the Conservative Climate Caucus. And these are uh, 
individuals in the Republican Party who, uh, you know, believe that, you know, climate change is happening and they're willing to be at the table and they're willing to, you know, negotiate to say, okay, well, let's try to see if we can find something similar, find something that we um, agree upon. And so again, this data on the right-hand side is from the Pew Research Center. Um, and the important thing to understand here is that climate change is a lower priority concern, but it doesn't mean that it's not a concern. It's just that they care about, you know, some activities uh, more than others. So if you look at, say, addressing climate change is a top concern, or one of several important concerns, that's about 40-some percent to uh, these individuals publicly that human climate, human activity contributes to climate change a great deal or some, and that um, climate scientists have too little or about the right amount of influence on science debate. So, you know, when you add these two numbers up, it's about over 50%, 60%, um, but we still have 44% who think it's, uh, it's too much. So we're making progress, but, you know, it's important to understand, you know, like where we are. And I emphasize that they're, talk, they're talking about climate scientists, of course, not all scientists. So um, here is what they, what worries, you know, Republicans about climate change. Uh, generally, the things that are related um, here in terms of the impact on um, job and economic growth, consumer cost, um, protecting the environment for future generations, and then all the way down here is getting to net zero as quickly as possible. So sometimes it's not that there's disagreement, but it's disagreement on the rate of change, how fast we do things, whether or not to do actions now or whether or not to do actions um, later. So uh, this again is from the, the uh, Climate Caucus. And the, the, the question that was asked here, this is in uh, political, Politico, which is a you know, DC publication, is thinking about carbon prices, pricing and thinking about sort of House Republicans. So as he says, it's important to understand that it's not just Republicans, but also Democrats who are not in favor of carbon uh, pricing. But he's willing to spend time with this group, Citizens Climate Lobby in, in Utah, which is where he's from, um, and go hikes and sort of talk with them. And um, when he, you know, like, so the person here at the leader on the hike says, well, why do you keep meeting with us and so forth? And he says, because they're interested in the end goal and we have some differences about it, but we do have a general interest in the end goal. So sometimes I think people believe that um, just, you know, they're, they're, they immediately go to this thing, like if they're a Republican, if, you know, they um, a conservative, that they don't care about climate change. And so it's just not worthwhile to talk to them. And you know, I really don't think that's the case. It's really more the nature that people, you need to find common ground. So when you look at the next slide, um, for example, you'll see these are the statements from the um, Climate Caucus in terms of what it is that they um, believe. Um, so, I think most of us would find common ground here with this thing about the climate's changing. And this has that, you know, there's been prosperity from this global industrial era, but it's also contributed to the change. Um, that there has been innovation um, and already investment that have lowered emissions, including um, uh, affording energy uh, and putting in the US as a global leader, reducing emissions there, you might find some challenges there. Uh, there's a lot of focus, um, and I've never quite understand as much why, uh, on, on China, though we know China is one of the biggest emitters, but that, that is a real challenge for a lot of people. They really focus on China in terms of emission reduction, that why should we do it if China is not, because we're competing with them. Um, and then looking at innovation, which I think all, you know, we're scientists, engineers, we believe in innovation. Um, uh, and that we want Americans and the rest of the world to have access to cheaper, reliable, cleaner energy. Um, now, this one is probably an area of disagreement, which is basically that fossil fuels can and should be part of the global solution. Uh, though I will say that realistically, if you look at the data, you'll find that fossil fuels, uh, you know, particularly in the area of transportation, 
um, are likely to be part of the solution for a long time. So it's something we have to think about. And the focus should be on reducing emissions, not energy choices. And that is also something that is uh, up for negotiation. So uh, what do we find, this is again going back to Chicago, is the biggest influence on public opinion and it's two things, it's science and extreme weather. Um, so you'll see here at the, the top that most Americans say scientists, extreme weather's affect their view on climate change. For recent extreme weather events, that's 51%. Personal observations of weather in your area are the two things that focus on the most. And so therefore that is like, if we're working and trying to do something at the, the uh, local level, that's something that we should really focus on is thinking about weather. That's something that impacts everybody, everybody understands what's happening. And then if you look down the next one about scientists, you'll see that about uh, half um, you know, of signed, you know, 54% say that scientists have a great deal or a lot of influence, which means that we can play a role in that. And you'll see it's much more, far more than all these other people who are combined, uh, including religious leaders, political leaders, and the media. So um, let's move on and talk about communication models. So um, this is a sort of nice collection of slides uh, that kind of talk about what it is. So oftentimes, like when I talk to um, scientists, engineers, you know, they'll say something like, oh, if they only understood, if they only knew, if, you know, if only I had a, you know, chance to educate them, uh, then, think, then, then they would change their mind. And what we know from research is that that is, that is not the case. Um, as is noted here, that there is a tendency in the scientific community to think citizens suffer from a deficit of knowledge and are incapable of grasping the complexity of science. Um, and it's a very like unidirectional activity. And the reason why I'm sure that that you know many of us have that is because that's the way we ourselves are taught. You know, there's this the sort of sage on the stage, like myself, of course, who is um, you know, communicating information and we are just there to soak it up and, and say, oh yes, this is, you're absolutely correct. No um, arguments, but that's not really, um, really the case. Uh, and so if we, there's these other models and the other models, as we go to the next slide, uh, is the public debate. So in public debate, it's not uh, the sage on the stage providing knowledge, but instead it's a debate where you're actually having uh, equal feedback so that it's, it's, it's a dialogue. And so I, for example, hold a lot of uh, round tables, you know, where we bring people around the table and I'm not the one providing the knowledge. I'm the one who is saying, you know, let's, you know, let, let, let's just try to, I'm in the listening mode as opposed to um, the talking mode. So, uh, for example, I've been working in West Virginia quite a bit, and you know, we uh, when we had uh, we had the the faculty of West Virginia University go and come up with a number of options for actions related to to water in West Virginia, um, which is one one of the states that's uh, it's going to be impacted by extreme weather conditions, extreme rain, and they already have had for decades or centuries really impact uh, a challenge with water. Um, you know, I told the faculty that I was working with, I said, you got to be in listening mode. You're not in talking mode. And amazingly, they listened to me. And we got a lot of really good input from people who are on the ground. So the next uh, model uh, is a, a co-creation model. So basically, you're working together and trying to figure out what makes uh, the most sense. You're recognizing that the people who are local have knowledge, the scientists have knowledge, and, and you're figuring out the next step. So the other thing that we asked um, the stakeholders to do in this West Virginia example is to, uh, we asked them to prioritize the recommendations. So the, so the scientists came up with the options, the scientists and engineers, but we, so we asked um, the, the group, which was a mix of people from different perspectives, 
to prioritize what they thought that, that we should recommend to policymakers. And they told us what they thought would work and what would not work in West Virginia. So it's really important to kind of get out of this knowledge deficit model and think of, of yourself on equal ground, equal footing, a much more democratic view of life if you really wanna have influence and, and make things happen. So, um, oh, back. Yeah. So now uh, we're going to talk about unconscious bias. So, uh, I last last uh, NSPN symposium, I did a whole thing on unconscious bias in public policy. I think it's it's really important to um, to to think about our unconscious biases. It's something that we all have. So we tend to focus often on things that are very visible biases you know, based on race or religion um, or gender or the, these other kinds of things. But within all of us, we have our own um, biases. And uh, it's important because research has told us in this, this link that I have, this, this uh, figure is from Georgetown. Um, and there, uh, there's a very useful center there that really talks about the psychological and science, you know, psychological science and other things behind bias. And I, if you've never watched the videos there, um, I encourage you to do so, so you can really understand how neuroscience and these things pay, uh, play a role. So we tend to, like when we meet somebody, like in an event, something that we didn't, and we've never met them before, you know, we will uh, start chatting with them and, you know, they start to tell us things about themselves. It might be what college they come from, what region they're from, um, it might be, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, what kind of work they do, all sorts of other things. And we immediately begin to stereotype them. Um, it's, it's just something that is, is part of our basic um, psychology. And in some cases, you know, it's a conscious bias and we sort of know that, you know, we, we don't like a certain person, but oftentimes it's unconscious bias so that we don't really realize necessarily that we are say, looking down on somebody as opposed to treating them um, as an equal. And sometimes this results in um, avert uh, behavior where it feels, you know, where, where you'll hear the public say, oh, the, you know, they, these guys are in an ivory tower. They don't understand anything about real life. And that's because you have done things that really make it clear uh, in terms of your level of respect. And sometimes it's like inadvertent behavior, you know, just, you know, kind of not really paying attention or, you know, look, uh, or uh, looking away or, or not really engaging with them in the emotionally. So, uh, so what we need to know about unconscious bias is that it's unconscious and automatic. So it's not something that you necessarily realize that you are doing, uh, it's pervasive. It's something that everybody has and um, it's important to recognize it. And sometimes it's, it doesn't always align with your explicit beliefs. In other words, you might believe one thing, uh, but you know, in the back of your mind, there's just that little voice saying, ah, I don't know, you know if I really do this. Um, it, it can have um, real effects on your behavior, but the good news is, is that it is malleable. In other words, you can change this. It can be unlearned and it can be replaced with new mental associations but you have to recognize that you have those biases. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into breakout sessions and everybody's gonna talk about their bias. So this is something um, I learned when I was working at the National Committee of Sciences and Engineering Medicine. At the beginning of every discussion, every, uh, there's a bias discussion. And what people do is they, uh, the committee members, all these top you know, engineers, scientists, health professionals, they talk about like what biases they have, you know, are they people who like, I'm really strongly in favor of a carbon tax or whatever it might be. So it might be policy related. It might be things related to like particular regions of the country. Like, you know, uh, we, you know, we live in the Midwest and we think those people on the East coast or the West coast, you know, they just live in another world, whatever it might be. Um, so here, these are some examples. Like, do you favor one party over another? Do you think one US geographic region is not as good as another? Uh, 
when I was in, in DC, I had a boss, for example, and we would go to the same meetings and come out with very, very different impressions of the people involved. And in this case, you know, one person was, this is, this is a person who was a senator, he was from Texas, former president of the university, but just because he had an accent that was from the Southwest, he immediately thought negative things about that person. That he was less educated, that all the, you know, all sorts of different things. And there's no re there was no reason for him to think it. It was just, you know, he came from the Northeast, and this is sometimes a, a bias. And when I lived in Texas in the Southwest, you know, we would talk about the Yankees up north who would come down and the snowbirds who'd come down to Texas. And, you know, they didn't understand the Texas way of life and, and so forth. Um, so do you favor one policy mechanism over another? Uh, you know, like regulation versus voluntary standards versus economics, for example, do you think finding one policy topic is more important than another? You know, like where would you rank, you know, assess uh, climate change policy in terms of where you would do things? And do you think that scientists, engineers, and health professionals are always right, even when it's not their area of expertise? Like a lot of us talk about climate change, for example, but not all of us have any training in climate change. Uh, we have climate change scientists who talk about mitigation. They might not have any engineering training, know much about mitigation or about adaptation. Um, so uh, what we want you to do is kind of think about these biases and then just reflect them to one another because that's part of the way that you know where you're um, at. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, let me see, go into breakout rooms. Welcome back. So uh, what I'd like you to do is uh, type into chat, not about your personal biases, but uh, about biases that you heard from your fellow students, just so we can sort of see a sampling of what's out there. And then it's also good, I also appreciate getting feedback if this was useful for you. Um, if it's something for you to, to think about. Okay, great. Thank you, Ben, for starting us off. So let's just spend a minute or two doing that. Okay, so we're typing in like biases, not our own personal biases, but what we heard from our fellow workshop participants. And um, just so we can sort of get a feeling for, for what's out there. So it looks, this looks like a... Um, a good uh, collection. So these are, you know, very, um, you know, sort of common ones that people hear like the, this one, this latest one about people like oil companies. But I always try to emphasize uh, that today, most of our energy company or most, most companies are not really oil companies, they're energy companies. And so although they, they do want to protect, um, you know, obviously, uh, a good portion of their income, oil, natural gas, and so forth. It's also true that they have investments um, in, um, in renewables. Like a lot of them are very focused, you know, have because they're big multinational companies, and particularly because in Europe, the, the energy policies tend to be a bit stronger often than the United States. Uh, you know, they, you know, so this is an income stream for them also. So they're kind of also in the process of transitioning. So it's important to understand that companies can change um, too. And it's going to vary. You know, there's still definitely some old style companies, but there's also a lot of uh, newer companies who are, you know, embracing, um, you know, our, our changing energy mix and what, what happens. So uh, thank you for sharing um, all that information. And then um, if go to the next slide, Rachel. So, uh, this is from Google, so uh, not Google, this is the Kiwan Institute, but it is, um, you know, thinking about like, what are you supposed to do now that you know you have these biases? Um, and uh, the first is, you know, when you're chit chatting with somebody, you know, you know, you know say that you, are, you know, do have one of the say, congressional fellowships, a fellowship in the state legislature, um, you know, you're just volunteering at something at the local level for a board or something always you know, sort of question your first impressions. Try to say like, am I really viewing these, this person as they are? Or am I letting some stereotypes you know, impact me? Um, and then when you are uh, 
and a very important part of the policy process is peer review. And so it's really important when, that you just don't say, okay, this is the way it should go. Instead, it's good to talk to colleagues about it, talk to people who know nothing about science engineering, family, friends, whatever it might be, and ask them for their feedback, you know? And that is, is another way to say, you know, is it, is, am I biased here? Am I, how do I hold myself accountable? So our research, you know, tells us that if we acknowledge this, if we know that we have these biases, we're much more likely to be able to tame it and um, to go into it, to, to, to have more honest and forthright dialogues with people uh, with whom we might not uh, always agree. And so you always wanna to try to find common ground. You always wanna to try to find things where you agree as opposed to focusing on where you disagree. So uh, thank you very much. And I'm turning it over to Rachel. Okay, thanks, Demi. So the second part we're gonna focus on um, just some other practical techniques that you can use to connect with policymakers and to the public and in particular talking about climate change. Um, but to bring us back to the communication models that Debbie was talking about um, before the breakout session, just a reminder. So really the whole goal when we're, when we're thinking about connecting with, with policymakers or trying to have meaningful conversations about climate change is maybe how I think about it, is that our, our goal should not be to educate. Take the word educate out of your vocabulary when it comes to talking about climate change, because really we want to engage and try to, try to develop those two-way conversations. Unless you build a relationship with a policymaker, have, have that relationship built, have trust built, um, and, and the person you're talking with wants to hear the information, um, it really doesn't do any good to share that knowledge. And even if you can share it in you know, a simple, non-complex way, I know that I did my graduate work in climate change. And so I listened to a lot of people talk about complex topics in a really simplified way that's easy to understand. But even if you can break down that information, it doesn't matter if you don't have that relationship built or that connection uh, built with the person you're talking to um, in order to you know, that they want to hear the information. So my background is, is mostly in working in Missouri. And so um, throughout this section, I'm gonna use my experiences in Missouri as sort of a case study. Um, but uh, first thing I wanna think about, so when we are thinking about techniques for communication, one of the first things we wanna do is know our audience. And so you've probably heard lots of things about if you're talking with a policymaker, you wanna know, uh, what district they're from, uh, something about their district, what their educational background is, what they do for a job, if they're a Republican or a Democrat, where their kids go to college. You know, you 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 want to do your background research. You want to know what policies they vote for and all these things. Um, but something else you also might think about is where where they fall on the climate change spectrum, and not just think about it as you know if you meet a Republican, they're going to be dismissive or a, a skeptic, and if you meet a Democrat, they're going to be wholly engaged and supportive of action. Um, so in Missouri, when we think about or when one of the most shocking things to me working with Missouri's lawmakers is that the phrase climate change just never gets brought up, not by Democrats, not by Republicans. It's literally just never talked about, um, not necessarily good or bad associated with it. It just is not brought up in conversations um, and probably for a lot of different reasons. But people are talking about things related to climate change or things that are impacted by climate change or that affect climate change every single day. Um, and so they are talking about agriculture, energy, and the environment, all which are directly related to climate change. Uh, they talk a lot about uh, the grid reliability, utility rates, market choices, energy efficiency. Uh, there's a lot of talk about biofuels and renewable natural gas, which of course um, those renewable fuels uh, are going to have an impact on emissions. And then when you get to talking to them about some of these things, they have a lot of concerns about new technologies for various reasons. They may be supportive of innovation, but have concerns about them, um, the economics and um, the, the market choice and um, implications of that technology. 
And then something that uh, we heard a lot in uh, a focus group that we did related to climate change in Missouri was people get, they don't really understand the difference between weather and climate. And so uh, we had a lawmaker once say, uh, you know, back in my day, we used to just call this flooding stuff weather, and now you call it climate change, and I just don't understand what the difference is. Um, but people are talking about the weather events, they're talking about the, the flooding that's occurring along the Missouri River and the Mississippi River, um, and the heat that's maybe causing cattle to be more stressed in agricultural settings, um, but they're not necessarily talking about climate change. But this is all, these are all areas where uh, you can find those common common points of interest and make connections. And so, uh, so in thinking about where people fall on the climate change spectrum, we often think that if we're, we're talking to somebody who isn't fully bought in on climate change, that they are dismissive. They you know, don't believe the science, they're not willing to take action, they're not concerned about it. But in reality, there's a big spectrum of where people might fall. Um, so this is a, a concept that was put together by the Yale Climate Change Communication Program, um, where they talk about these six Americas and how they understand global warming. And so we dismissive, you know, is that, you know, people who completely deny that this is happening, but we might have lawmakers or, or members of the public who just like don't know anything about it. So they're completely disengaged or you know, they know a little bit and they're kind of concerned, but they don't know enough to really do anything about that. They might be just cautious. Um, you know, It might be that they're a Republican and Republicans aren't supposed to support climate change action. And so they're really cautious in deciding if they're going to publicly support something. Um, and based on the information that Debbie provided, more and more Republicans, so, so people on both sides of the aisle are really down on the on the left side of the spectrum in the alarmed and concerned categories. Um, but I think really just remember that when you're talking to somebody, uh, don't just automatically assume that they're down on the far right end, that they're completely dismissive. There's probably um, people who fall in the middle there for a lot of different reasons. And so we're gonna use this model today or this framework today in our breakout rooms. Um, but there's a lot of different frameworks that you can use in order to have effective conversations. And so, you know, I mentioned earlier that you have to get to the point where they want to potentially know more about climate policies or um, climate change information, maybe actions that they can take. Before you get to that point, here are some techniques or this is a framework that you can use in order to try to build your relationship and build connections in order to get to that place. Um, eventually with being able to engage on climate change. And uh, when I say climate skeptic, I mean anybody who's not down there in that alarmed or concerned category. So this might be someone who, you know, is just completely disengaged, could be someone who's dismissive, someone who's doubtful, someone who's cautious about the information. So we're going to go through these five um, different categories. So um, we're going to start with ask. So being able to ask questions back. So uh, if someone decides that they're going to have a conversation with you about climate or you're having just a conversation and they say something about climate change, um, ask genuine questions to try to get more information from them rather than you know, just disputing what they say with facts. Uh, actively listen to their responses and be able to ask follow-up questions. Try to reflect back some of the things that you're hearing, validate some of the, the things that they might be saying, or at least validate in a way that you are understanding and they know that you're understanding um, kind of what they're saying and what they're feeling about what they're saying. Uh, talk about points that you agree upon. Uh, finding those, those points of common ground is really important to build trust. And then um, instead of just thinking with your scientist hat on, um, really think about your experience as a person and maybe why you're passionate about sh sharing climate science or why you're passionate about taking action on climate change um, from a personal perspective, um, rather than just thinking about things um, as a scientist. So in the breakout room, we're going to give you some prompts here and um, you're going to be uh, in pairs or like in two or three people. And so just take turns going back and forth with the prompts. And then um, 
so one person asks the question and then um, the other person, you'll have a chance to respond. And these, these prompts that I've put together here as an example are somewhat based on conversations I've had um, with lawmakers in Missouri. So they are, I think, fairly real um, scenarios. And the, the one that we're, we've given you in the breakout room also hopefully is something that maybe you've heard before or might deal with in the future. So Debbie, do you wanna help me go through these and um, we can kind of go back and forth and model uh, what this looks like? Okay. So I'll, uh, I will start with the ask, with the, the, this prompt here. The people in my district are dealing with real problems every day and I don't have time during my eight years in office to deal with distant problems like climate change. Okay, so now with my response, I wanna ask a question back. And I wanna ask a question that you know keeps them talking about this information and gets more, more information from them. So I might say something like, that's interesting. What are some of the biggest issues that the people in your district are facing? Now I'm gonna to respond to my own question uh, and then Debbie is gonna demonstrate the listening um, response. Um, so we asked what other issues are pressing in, in this uh, legislator's district. Um, and then they respond, the economy has been horrible for farmers. So this is someone from a rural area. Economy has been horrible for farmers. Prices of grain are low, input costs keep going up. And on top of that, we got no rain last summer. And so Debbie's gonna to respond um, to show that she's actively listening um, and understanding what this person is saying. It sounds like farmers are facing a lot of challenges. What has the weather been like for farmers the last few years? All right, and then we'll have uh, Debbie ask this prompt back and then we can demonstrate reflecting. You know, it, it seems like it's been flooding one year and drought the next. Farmers just never know what to expect anymore. And so reflecting, again, we're trying to capture, you know, showing that we understand, but also kind of reflecting back uh, the emotions that they're showing. Um, to show that we we under yeah understand um, not just the facts of the situation but also kind of how that makes them feel. That must be frustrating. Are you doubtful that these weather patterns are related to climate change? And then they might respond, um, and this is something that I've heard before. But I thought climate change just made it hotter. Even if temperatures get higher, farmers will be able to handle it. And then Debbie can show agreement. I agree that climate change causes temperatures to increase and farmers are definitely resilient. So she, she highlighted some areas where she agrees instead of, you know, trying to say, which when I was writing this prompt, by the way, I really wanted to explain why warmer temperatures are causing all these things that happen in Missouri, but you resist and you, you know, point out those points of agreement, say, yes, climate change does cause temperatures to increase. And yes, farmers can handle it. They are resilient. And then stop there, even though the scientist in you wants to continue talking about all the science related to that. It was really hard to write this response for me. <laughs> okay, then Debbie, you want to ask this or do this last prompt? Uh, even if these new weather patterns are caused by climate change, I still don't think there's anything we should do about it. We got bigger fish to fry. And then now I want to show, or now I want to share. So share a little bit about my personal experience because you know it seems like we're we're comfortable enough that we're having the conversation now. So I might say something like. You know, farmers were actually the reason I first became passionate about this issue. Let me tell you why. And be genuine with this sharing um, and, and, and try to find those points of, of common ground and build that personal connection with the person you're talking to. Now, Rachel, we have a question in chat, which is what if they're just dead wrong? You know, I think the, and I'm guessing you're referring to the agree um, the agree tactic. So don't agree with something that's not 
you know, not correct, if it's not something you agree with on, on all these things, it's, it's so important to be genuine because people can tell if you're not being genuine. Um, but I think that the point here is not to be argumentative, you know, to, you know, if, if they say something that's just dead wrong, maybe use the ask um, technique and say, you know, ask a question back to try to get more information about why they feel that way or why they think that. Um, and then when you do find those points that you can agree on, that's when you really want to jump on that and be able to talk, uh, to identify that, that you agree with them, I think, um, would be what the strategy is here. Mm -hmm. um, and then I uh, have something else, which is the last response here assumes you have a shared experience, which if that's not, what if that's just not true and you've grown up very different? I think the way that I responded here, um, shows shared experience. I don't necessarily think that you have to have shared experience. I think for this, the sharing concept more, it's just allow them to get to know you as a person and why you think things are, think things are important. Not necessarily, um, you know, yes, you want to try to find points of common ground. You know, it could be they care about you know, farmers' economic livelihood, and you care about the economic livelihood of some other population of people who you grew up with. So it's, I think you don't necessarily have to have, you know, identical shared experience. You're more looking for those kind of shared values almost. Um, and yeah, it may be a little harder, or at least even if you don't find those shared values to be able to try to allow them to get, you know, get to know you as a person a little bit. Um, if some of those shared values aren't immediately obvious. And I, I just, I would kind of add to that, that it's, it's also not just how you've grown up, right. But, you know, you're all Americans, you know, in this, in this conversation, um, you're people who, you know, most people care about their family. They care about their friends they care about animals, you know? Um, so, you know, it's, it's just sort of thinking about, um, you know, life in general, thinking about them as people, you know, and not thinking about them as, you know, somebody you have to, you know, convince that, you know, you shouldn't respect them or whatever it is, you know, ideally you live in the same town, you know, you maybe, you know, maybe, uh, you know, the, the farmer's kids went to the same high school or, you know, all these different kinds of things. Um, now, I, I realize, like, this is challenging. I was telling Rachel when I was a field engineer and, and I was uh, um, working for the state of Texas uh, Air Pollution Agency, and we'd have these meetings. So I had given a violation. I was telling somebody that they had violated air pollution law in Texas. And my boss, who came from NASA, they would spend like the first 15 minutes talking about baseball. Now, you know, I, I know nothing about baseball. I know nothing about football, right? But he didn't do what I would have done, which is to dive in and say, you know, hey, I can't believe you violated this law, you company, or whatever it is. You know, the 15 minutes were this chit chat to kind of set the stage. And we tend oftentimes as scientists and engineers to be very direct. And sometimes that's not the best way to do it. And I certainly have been challenged by this my entire life. So I, I, I totally understand this, but it's really kind of holding things back and answering questions uh, as opposed to making statements. So uh, I, I've, this is you know, like when I was at the National Academies and I'd be you know, with these committees, with all these big wigs and I would disagree with some famous person, maybe even Nobel Prize scientist on something. And I once say to them, hey, you know, I think you're wrong. Here's the real facts, right? But I would say, that's interesting. Why do you think that? Okay. And that provides them a reason that creates a dialogue. And it's, a, you know, it's the same thing with that Nobel Prize winner as it is with that farmer in Missouri. It's, it's, it's really no different. And it's just one of these things you got to learn in life to hold back, even though you really want to go out there and attack. <laughs> okay all right so um we're a little behind schedule but we'll spend um maybe like eight eight to ten minutes in the breakout rooms so we're going to share a link in chat we've got another um another set of prompts that you can um 
that you can walk through. So take turns responding to the prompts. Uh, we don't give we give you examples, but try to come up with you know how you might respond in in that setting. And then if you get done early, there's also um, some other conversation starters uh, that are some of the top questions that climate skeptics have. Um, and so then if you can think through those ask, listen, reflect, agree, and share um, type scenarios. And um, Debbie, can you- Yes, I will do the breakout rooms. We, we won't go through like a, a verbal reflection of this activity, but if you have any thoughts, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and then uh, we'll come back to that question that was asked before we went into the chat or before we went to the breakout rooms as well. Um, but some of the, so next steps. So now that you have this information, what are some things you can do with it? Um, the holidays coming up are a great time to maybe try to engage with one of those family members who you typically just ignore or have an argument with over the holidays. Um, you know, try to use these techniques in talking with your family. They're there, they're always gonna be your family. You know, they gotta love you. So this is a great, great uh, time to practice. Um, but some other things that you can do um, in thinking about how to, to communicate with the general public, uh, think about writing an op-ed. Uh, obviously, you're not being, you know, too responsive in an op-ed. You might be responding to something, so you can't, you know, respond back directly to what people are saying, but you can practice these concepts of trying to build a connection um, through how you're writing instead of, you know, just talking about the facts of the situation or about climate change. And then when you're talking to your elected officials, again, approach them um, in this manner of trying to build trust and connections um, rather than just trying to give them the facts. Um, and especially with legislative sessions coming up in most of your states, um, starting next spring, uh, that might be a good time to practice in your state. Um, and then there'll also be, you know, all the professional society fly-ins going on. Um, uh, or, you know, if you're tweeting at your elected officials or sending them an email, another great time to practice uh, using these principles. And then we've got an opportunity with Forefront um, as well that you might be interested in. Um, so we are... Uh, currently taking submissions related to um, preparing local communities for the impact of climate change. Um, and so yeah, you can check out our Forefront website if you're interested in submitting a blog. We have a, a pretty light peer review process. We just ask that you, you know, are writing things in a fact-based manner and don't have a bunch of grammatical errors. Um, but it's a great way to get your work out there and to share it with a broader audience. So we encourage you to check this out, um, especially this um, submission process if you're interested in climate change communication. And so Debbie, I'll uh, send it back to you to wrap up. Yeah, well, thanks everybody for attending. So um, a couple things. Uh, we're at the end of our time, but we are gonna stay on longer for those of you who have questions, but if you need to move on, um, feel free to do so. Uh, if you type your questions in a chat, that'd be great. Uh, we also would appreciate any feedback. This is the first time that uh, Rachel and I have done this together, but we're going to do it again in just uh, like about an hour or so. So other than the obvious technical error, uh, uh, what other comments? Let us know if this is useful, uh, ways that we can improve it, all these things. So before you leave, if you could do that, that would be great. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to start going through the questions and uh, hope that they will be useful. So I'm going back to this uh, initial question here. Let me see. So, which, so feel which, free to hop off if you need to. to yeah, yeah, feel free to leave if you gonna, need to. Uh, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna keep going, uh, you know, for like until the top of the hour till like three o'clock. Okay, so Ben asked, you know, is this advice um, for meeting with policymakers? Don't they have such limited schedules that they might get frustrated with the slow approach? So uh, I would say first, this is not as slow as you think it is, because you know we're trying to teach you a new method. But you know you have conversations. So the ones I always like to visualize is when I was in D.C. There was a million different like, you know, like receptions, lunch events. You're just sitting next to somebody at a hearing. Lots of different things that are happening, and you have these kind of chit chats that go on. Um, and you know you can go back and forth like four or five times all within like five minutes or something. So again, if you're in the listening mode as opposed to the talking mode, then this will work. Anything you wanna to add to that, Rachel? I was just gonna say lawmakers love to talk about themselves in their districts. And so if you can get them talking about some of these things in more of that like chit chatty way, um, 
you know, I've gotten, I get stuck in lawmakers offices. Like you would think they don't have time to talk with you about this kind of stuff, but they'll talk to you for an hour. If, if you give them the time, sometimes, uh, these are state lawmakers. So maybe they have a little more flexibility, but yeah, don't, don't assume that they don't have time, you know, uh, take advantage of that, like chit chatty, uh, time to get to know them and build that connection. And just a, another relevant point is like when I, when I was at the White House, for example, I would actually have to, um, you know, like uh, recruit people for my public comment sessions. Uh, so that's another way that you can sort of reach out, you know, make a public comment at a council meeting or, you know, a board meeting or, you know, any sort of thing that's out there. Um, you know, the, the, there's definitely opportunities to give public comment if you want, want to do it. So then our next question is from Alicia, and she says, what do you do when the decision to disengage, oh, sorry, when do you make the decision to disengage when you see the conversation is unlikely to have a meaningful outcome? So how would you answer that, Rachel? You know, I think that, um, so my, my first thoughts on this is when you think back to that spectrum of dismissive over to, you know, alarm, alarmed is that, you know, maybe somebody's not going to vote for the bill that you want them to vote for, but you having that conversation and having it in a respectful way that's hopefully building trust, like that's a great outcome. And, you know, maybe, you know, if someone's just completely dismissing you and like clearly doesn't be want, want, doesn't want to have the conversation, I mean, I think that's when, when I would get out of it, but I, I would think about, you know, what is, what do you mean by meaningful outcome? You know, even if they're not going to vote for the policy you want them to vote for, or if they're not going to make the policy decision that you're thinking of, you still might be having a meaningful conversation that's going to move them a little bit along the line, or at least help you build trust as someone who can come back to them later. And then they might, might be willing to, you know, have a different outcome uh, or make a different decision. And, you know, this is another time where it's really great to just, uh, don't just disengage and go off and say, oh, you know, we can, we, you know, we're just gonna have to agree to disagree or something like that. Instead, switch the topic, talk about something else, talk about the football game, talk about the weather, talk about, you know, boy, isn't this a beautiful building or, uh, oh, I've never been in the state house before or whatever. Just make sure you end on a positive note. That's really the, the, the key. Um, but if you're not making progress, you're not making progress, but that doesn't mean you don't want to end in a very positive note. Okay, so this one again is from Ben. Um, a question that came up in our breakout group: Would it be too would it be productive or too knowledge deficity to approach the agreement step with something like, "Yes, I used to think that too, but I've since come across some pretty compelling evidence." Um, I know I would answer this, Rachel. How are you going to answer it? I think that what you're saying there is shared experience, maybe, uh, but, but I guess. I, if you're, if you're wanting to find agreement, um, it's not agreement, but it's agreement. Um, yeah. and so, you know, only point out points of agreement if it's, it's genuine agreement, I think. Yeah. To me, it, it sounds too knowledge deficit. -y. Oh, you know, it's, it's basically telling the person, well, I know more than, you know, that's basically what you're saying. Okay. So let me see. Um, oh yes. The slides will be available later. So what we, what we plan to do is we plan to post um, our video uh, and we'll post um, our slide deck and we'll also post the handout on the Forefront website. Does that sound good, Rachel? Yes. Yep. That's yes. the plan. Exactly. Yes. And we'll try to see, we'll talk to NSPN and see if we can share it out with everybody who attended the workshop. Yeah. Maybe they post them. I can't remember what happened last year, but we'll also, we'll do whatever it is they tell us to, uh, to do. Okay, um, some unconscious biases follow you into the conference room that cannot be shed like ideologies, for example, race and gender. How do you overcome those biases to have a productive conversation? Okay, so um, I spent my life, my, well, my engineering life, five years in Texas as a woman engineer. I was the only regional engineer, uh, you know, in I think almost the entire state of Texas. <laughs> For, who worked for the Texas Air Control, Control Board, the Texas Air Pollution Agency at the time. Um, and it's just, you know, what you kind of learn over time is the same sort of thing. You look for areas of common ground, you know? So, you know, if uh, I, I, used to be, I used to go and there would be a, a 
I have to give somebody a violation for burning a tire. There'd be a guy with a shotgun and a dog. I have to say, excuse me, sir, you have violated the air pollution laws for the state of Texas. Um, and, um, you know, you just have to just keep on going, talking, you know, show that you care about your family, talk about, you know, like, you know, talk about who you are. And so they don't think of you as a stereotype. They think of you as a person. So I think add to that, Rachel, as I move on. Um, I think that was the last question. I, you know, usually my response to this is just that, like, I, I recognize that when I approach this, I'm, you know, a white heterosexual woman having these conversations with people who may have, you know, stereotypes and biases. Um, and so it's much different if you, you know, have intersectional things that you are not shutting, you know, as you walk into those conversations, like you said. And so it's, um, I, I have trouble answering this question and recognize that like, you should also like protect yourself and don't put yourself in an uncomfortable situation. If, you know, that's, um, you know, like I, I wouldn't encourage anybody to continue to have a conversation with someone who's being clearly racist. You know, um, I think it, it's, it's fine to leave those particular situations. Um, yeah, so we have one more uh, thing here, which is, um, in the breakout room, we discussed feeling like it was difficult to not come across as condescending or like we were attacking people, even when we are truly are just trying to have a conversation. Do you have any tips or partic um, particular language to use or avoid? Any this is so important. Yeah, because I think as scientists, we walk into the room and think that we are the expert in the room. Um, so my tip for this, what I always try to think of is, I try to like identify the expertise of the person I'm talking to. So like consider if I'm in a room of staffers and lawmakers and lobbyists and you name it, everybody in that room is an expert at something. And so I just try to think about my expertise as being part of that conversation and probably un a unique part, but not, I'm, you know, I try to humble myself to think that everybody else in the room is an expert as well. Um, and I'm trying to like learn from their experiences and them as much as they might be trying to learn from me, which, you know, might not be the case at all. Uh, so that, that's the, like the tip that I use when I go into those conversations. Debbie, anything else that you, any like practical tips for avoiding condescending language? Um, yeah, I think part of it is just um, recognizing the expertise of the other people in the room. So you know, like when um, when you have fellows, you know, fellows who go and work in um, at at um, either on Capitol Hill or at federal agencies or state legislatures, state agencies, things like that. It's important to recognize that they are too an expert. It's just an expert in something different than in which you are an expert. And so, you know, you want to instead, you know, sort of think about learning from them as as opposed to them learning from you. So for me, it's always important, like if I'm like right now, I'm doing a study on carbon dioxide removal, West Virginia, um, you know, we're talking about things regarding agriculture, you know, different, like the different policies um, that, you know, might be in place. And so I think it's important for me to recognize that I am, you know, even though I know a lot about policy, I've spent decades learning it, practicing it, 40 years. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'm an expert on the policy that is best for an agriculture you know, and for a farmer, uh, uh, a family farmer who is in West Virginia, who's growing corn or something, you know, um, they, they are an expert, right? And I need to respect that and not just say, hey, you know, you really should, you know, like use carbon, you know, do this whole carbon credit thing so you can get credit for growing your corn, you know, so. Um, okay, so I just wanted to end on one last note. Uh, so we got a comment uh, from about it'd be nice to learn different approaches for op-eds versus meetings, public comments, public memos, policy memos, so forth. So um, I do have, I have done like all, a lot of these things, but I do think it's something that is an interesting topic and related to advocacy, things like that, uh, versus like uh, informative. And you know what? We can think about it for next year's NSPN Symposium. Uh, because it is, you know, I've done bits and pieces of that before, um, but I haven't done it in a strategic way. So I will add it among my list of symposiums uh, or events or whatever to do, or who knows, you know, somebody might ask us back again, Rachel. So uh, with that, uh, 
And thank you very much for attending our workshop. Again, if you could give us some comments before you go, that would be fantastic. Otherwise, thank you for coming and have time, you know, have fun time at the rest of your NSPN symposium. Until next time. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>